morning and welcome to Begin in the Word. Today in our study of Ephesians, we're up to lesson 44 in this series. And today's study brings us to near the end of Ephesians chapter 6 in verses 13 through 17. Here he describes the armor of God. Therefore take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, in the recent study, we talked about that the context is challenging us to be strong, but that our strength is in the Lord. So we make choices to engage God's strength in our fight against Satan and his allies. So we choose to take on God's strength when we choose to put on the armor of God. He says, therefore, at the beginning of this verse, and so this keys off of what had been said previously about being strong in the Lord. And understand that this strength is from the Lord because the armor is from the Lord. This armor that enables us in our fight against Satan and temptation, that is from God and therefore the strength is from God. And this armor equips us to succeed. It makes us able to withstand. Now, Let's think a little bit more about the particulars of this armor as we continue in verse 14 through 17. Stand, therefore, having, your, uh, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So here in describing the Christian armor, he starts out by talking about the girding of your waist, and that in uh, the Roman military, the Roman soldier's armament included a sash, and that sash would hold the other pieces of the armor and equipment together. So it is the truth that holds together the other parts of the armor of God. He goes on and talks about uh, the breastplate of righteousness, but we understand where that righteousness comes from. It ultimately comes from God, and God teaches us about this in his truth. So the truth of God's word that ties our armor together, this helps us to resist sin. You might recall, if you're a student of scripture, that in Psalms 119, verse 9 through 11, the psalmist talked about hiding God's word in his heart that he might be able to resist sin and resist temptation. So the truth of God's word ties everything together in helping us to resist the temptation to sin. And that brings us to our breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate in the Roman armor protected, of course, the vital organs there in the trunk of the body. And so it was a very key and vital part of the uh, Roman soldier's armament. Now, this righteousness here, we need not think of this as solely resting on our own goodness because certainly our own righteousness would be deficient. We learn in Philippians 3 and 9 that ultimately our righteousness comes from Christ, but it comes from Christ when we choose to submit to Christ. So we participate in the process by virtue of the choices that we make, but it's Christ and his saving blood that ultimately makes us righteous and acceptable to God. And so this dependence on Christ and living in the choices of following him becomes a key part of our Christian armament. He goes on in the next verse to talk about the footwear. He said the feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Footwear allows the soldier to be mobile. Think about a soldier out on the battlefield, a foot soldier trying to move about freely barefooted. Whatever sharp rocks or sharp plants they might step on, that's going to, even if they're tough and trying to be resilient against the pain, that's going to impede their ability to move freely. But you protect the feet, you protect the soldier's ability to be mobile. And so we think as this uh, illustration speaks to our Christian armor, our mobility with the gospel in, in fighting the Christian fight of taking the gospel to the lost and, and not only fighting against Satan in our own lives, but inviting others to join that fight and be saved, 
that indicates that we're seeking a preparing or a readiness of the gospel. We're careful students of the word of God. And that makes us more mobile as soldiers in the army of the Lord. Knowledge of God carries us to our task of taking the gospel to the lost. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 through 6, he talks about the light of the gospel being involved in the fight against Satan and Satan's desire to stop the advance of the gospel and blind the minds of people so that they won't hear the gospel and be saved. And then he also mentions the shield of faith here in this section of the Christian armor. We understand that our faith then is our shield against Satan's darts. When we think about Satan's onslaught against us, the Bible talks about the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's the various ways that Satan tries to get at us. And in the illustration of the physical soldier, so to speak, uh, pierce our body and our vital organs with life-threatening temptations and life-threatening problems or soul-threatening, salvation-threatening. And resist, we resist those things by putting our faith in God and faithfully following his will. The next part of the armor he mentions is the helmet of salvation. The helmet in the Roman soldier's armor protects the center of thought and action. It's in your head, in your brain that you choose to react and then you make the decisions related to the manner of your fight uh, in whatever battle in which you are engaged. And so that center of thought must be protected with the helmet of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8 talks about this and refers to this helmet as the hope of salvation. So the salvation, the ultimate deliverance of the body from this wretched world of sin and the hope of having a home with God forever in our heavenly home, that hope of salvation protects our center of thought and action. Our hope of being with God in eternity is what recenters and redirects our efforts to work and labor for him and live for him and fight against Satan. And then he mentions the offensive weapon. He's already described our feet, our footwear, our mobility of carrying the gospel of peace to the lost. That gospel is redescribed in other terms when he talks about the sword of the spirit. The sword could be a defensive weapon, a sword used to block the shot of the enemy as they fight with their weaponry, or it could be an offensive weapon. That's the way it was in Roman warfare. The Roman soldier, which is likely the, uh, the concept had in mind here in the Ephesian letter and for the sake of this illustration, them being a part of the Roman empire, certainly would think of the Roman soldier. So the Roman soldier could use his sword for defense or offense, but ultimately that weapon allows one to not just block the shot of the enemy, so to speak, but to move forward in the battle to bring other soldiers or other souls to the side of God in the war for the hearts of men. God's powerful word is that sharp sword that we use in battle. Ephesians 4 and 12 assures us and comforts us with the thought of how powerful this sword weapon is in the battle for souls. So we use that sword, which is the spirit's weapon to reach the human heart. We use that sword to protect ourselves and we use that sword to reach the heart of others. The powerful word of God. And I'm so thankful that you've joined us today for this study of the powerful word of God. And as we've begun today in the word, I pray that you'll live out today and every day in the mighty word of God. Thank you and God bless.